Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Remote No Pressure Podcast. We're super excited to have another episode out here for you. Uh, I don't know if you guys checked it out, but I did my very first Facebook Live video this week. My uh, millennial sister-in-law said it would be a good idea, and she had to kind of show me a few things. And since a lot of you guys are uh, are on uh, Instagram, then we did that video. So it's kind of cool, but it said a lot of ums and stuff. So that's awesome. That's really cool. But hey, we got to go out there. We got to put ourselves out there, you know, be uncomfortable. That's what the R&P podcast is all about. A couple things, a couple house, housekeeping things. Um, I don't know if you guys listen to music sitting at your fly tying vice, but if you do or if you like music, we created a remote no pressure radio page on Spotify. On Spotify. So if you go on Spotify and you look up remote no pressure fly tying radio, what we did is we went into some forums and we asked, hey, what do you listen to when you're tying? And we got this huge list and there's a lot of people that, a lot of bands I'd never even heard of and it's just really cool. So check it out. It's just this curated playlist, okay, of all these great, a lot of you guys, I, w- I was really surprised by by the, some of the music and I, I, was re- I was personally introduced to a lot of great new, new music. So if you're sitting at your fly tying vice, check it out. Go to Spotify and look up Remote No Pressure Fly Tying Radio. Also, go to our website, sign up for our mailing list, remotenopressure.com. I should probably be more intentional about that because that would probably, like, I know there's a lot of people out there saying, hey, you you know, spend more time on that. Okay, look, go to our website, remotenopressure.com, and sign up for our mailing list. Okay, now, on to the podcast episode. Now, it's exciting. We have this week... University of Michigan creative writing professor Dave Karzinski here with us. Now, that name may sound familiar to you because he's been featured in the Drake, the Flyfish Journal, Fly Rod and Reel, and Outdoor Life, and he's the author of a couple of books. But one of the books I want to talk about today with Dave and that we talk about is his new book, From Lure to Fly, Fly Fishing for Spinning and Baitcast Anglers. Now, Dave Karzinski He's just a great writer. Sure, he's super talented, but more than anything, he's just a great guy to talk to. And he's going to tell us a couple stories about fishing the the boundary waters. And I believe in the winter Drake, he has um, he has a story too in the in the winter Drake coming out. So be sure to watch out for that. If you don't know what the Drake is, go to your fly shop, ask them for the Drake. They'll hand it to you. Um, so welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Today on the Remote No Pressure podcast, we have Dave Karzinski with us. Thank you very much for joining us, Dave. Uh, thanks for having me on the show, Jeff. Good to be here. Well, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into fly fishing, Dave? Absolutely. Uh, well, I'm a lifelong angler. I come from a family of anglers around the Chicago area. And I grew up not in fly fishing, but uh, pretty fanatical spinning and baitcast angler. And in my late teens, uh, I started wanting to get more, I think, from my, my time on the water. And I was always really curious about, you know, fly fishing. I'd seen it on TV shows, never really up close. Where I lived, there weren't a lot of fly anglers. But around the same time, I was also playing a lot of guitar. And I went from an electric with an, I'm sorry, yeah, with elect, went from an electric guitar with an amp to a classical guitar, and I was finger picking. And it just, I like that connection, uh, the instrument, and I saw fly fishing as a way to kind of do something similar with my time on the water. Um, get more manual, get more connected, um, get more plugged in, and uh, I went that direction, and I never really looked back. Uh, you know, fished here my whole life, but once I took up the fly rod, it just felt so much different, so much better, so much more natural. Um, so that was uh, how I came to fly fishing in my late teens, early 20s. Now, you recently wrote a book for people making the transition. Am I correct? Yeah. You know, um, so uh, this year, uh, two books that came out. Uh, one was a book on smallmouth bass, you know, four fly anglers that I co-authored with my good friend, Tim Landwehr, who runs a great fly shop and a great smallmouth bass program um, out of northeastern Wisconsin. Um, but I also wrote a book uh, called From Lure to Fly, Fly Fishing for Spinning and Baycast Anglers. Uh, because it was a really hard transition when I made it from you know the gear to the fly fishing world. I wanted to do it, but 
even the the texts that were really trying to to make it simple for me were kind of kind of complicating things. Um, so it's hard to kind of remember. I mean, a lot of us came from gear, um, and a lot of us maybe forgot, you know, what those early transitional stages were like. But I had really dumb questions, like a streamer, right? So a weird name to give to a fly <laughs> that you know, imitates largely a bait fish. Yeah. But with the word streamer, I found myself thinking, well, can you use this in still water or does it have to be in the stream? I mean, really dumb questions for a guy who's <laughs> fishing. His whole life is fishing really well. We're talking I mean, the whole thing, you know, bait casting, spinning, you know, live bait lures. Um, but I really felt like a total idiot when I first took up the fly rod. I was motivated um, and I pushed through it. But I had a lot of other friends who were also kind of curious, you know, tried it out. It was just so different and so hard to make the transition that they gave it up. So I really enjoy, you know, all the, the challenges and, again, the manual connection of fly fishing. So I thought, what if I could write a book that would, you know, be for those guys who were kind of like competent gear anglers, you know, popping over to fly fishing, not used to feeling frustrated when they're, when they're on the water. That was like a really big thing. When I was on the water, I was used to catching fish, used to knowing what I'm doing, like used to like, you know, nailing my cast and, and, and really feeling competent. Fly rod felt so incompetent. I pushed through, but I'm trying to make it easier for other people to push through um, if they want to give the sport a try. Yeah, that's great. Uh, kudos to you. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that listen to our podcast, Dave, that actually don't even fly fish, but they like the stories and they like, you know, I, I've had emails from people that say, hey, I, I'm really stressed out. I, I think I'm going to try this. I've listened to your podcast. I think I want to try this whole fly fishing out uh, thing out. So that's always cool to have a manual or something that they can have access to, uh, to kind of give them a little of encouragement uh, to make that transition. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that struck me early on when I was first getting into fly fishing, um, one thing that really surprised me was how many books there were about fly fishing. Um, not just how to books, but like really great narrative books, essays, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I kind of dip into the literature, and I think the numbers are kind of outrageous. Like eight out of every ten books on fishing is about fly fishing. Wow. Um, so if you look at the kind of like the, the fishing record in the English language, there were there right now there. You know, well, I guess that's not all that surprising because you know we call in the fly world conventional tackle. We call it. Um, you know, we, we use that to talk about spinning and bay casting tackle. Like if that was the first thing or that was normal. And actually, um, spinning and bay casting reels are a relatively new invention. You know, people have been casting um, tapered, you know, horsehair fly lines for a long time before that. So I think a lot of people might think that fly fishing is the thing that maybe developed after, you know, spinning and bay cast fishing just because, you know, spinning and bay cast fishing is so much more predominant. Um, but now, like, fly, like, Casting um, a, a, an unweighted fly with a tapered line, that was kind of how um, sport fishing really got started. So it goes back a couple thousand years. So it's a, it's a long tradition with a lot of cool history. And I love the culture of it. I mean, you know, this podcast is a great example celebrating the culture. Yeah, more more like the philosophy behind it. And, you know, we, we had um, artist Bob White on our show. Yeah. Bob is a great, great artist, great angler, great guy. Uh, Yeah. And, and we've had, you know, AD Maddox, which is another, um, um, lady out of uh, Nashville area. Who's a fly fishing painter. You know, we've had a few of those, um, on, on the, uh, on the podcast. And what gets me about it all is that it seems like with fly fishing, art is not too far away from that. And either it's writing or, you know, painting pictures. For some reason, it seems like art and fly fishing kind of go hand in hand. Would you agree to that? Absolutely. I mean, it's really striking and, I mean, um, almost mystifying like how many people find ways to express themselves um, through fly fishing. You're a musician. Um, and even if you're not a musician or a writer or a painter, like making your own flies is kind of it's a, an expression of the self. So mm-hmm. um, I think it's so cool that there's so many people, you know, into fly fishing who have blogs, who take photos, who write songs, who, you know, do all these other things. So um, I don't know why that necessarily is, but it's 
certainly something unique to the sport. Maybe it's part of what draws people to it. Um, they want to find an outdoor experience that's going to allow them to like have some artistic, expressive, you know, component to it. And I think fly fishing really does that. So if anybody's listening out there that <laughs> doesn't get fly fish, it really is. Um, for me, it, it was all that I thought it would be and a lot more. So, because when I was on the outside looking in, it seemed like this really promising, fascinating, mysterious sport. And uh, the colors of Arrival did not fade. It's a really cool enterprise. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It, it almost like feeds the soul, you know, and our emotions and things like that are in our soul. I know I'm getting kind of uh, philosophical or whatever, but um, but, you know, it's like there's this feeling when you're out there. Ca- and, you know, I grew up fishing salt. I, I grew up fishing uh, on the Gulf of Mexico down in the Houston area. And, you know, we would we would catch big red fish and, and we all use spinning gear. But when I moved to Michigan and then uh, probably about four or five years ago, I started fly fishing. It was completely different. It, it was something I I can't explain. And I'd, I'd love to fly fish for redfish and whatnot. But um, since I started fly fishing and made that switch, it's definitely been a positive experience for sure. Yeah. I mean, it just really does. Everything has to be a deliberate decision. And, um, there are a lot of decisions to make. I mean, standing on a bank with a a spinning rod and you've got trees at your back, you can just make a cast. The fly rod, you've got a back cast or you've got to like perform a roll cast. So I like the way that I, I like the way that it kind of like, you know, interacts with space. Like I know where I am in space when I have a fly rod because it forces me to be aware of how deep the water is, where the trees are where obstructions are um, in ways that other, the other fishing, because it's, you know, the casting process is so different. So I, I think part of it for me is like when I'm out fly fishing, like I have a different like understanding of space and I'm moving through space differently and it slows me down and makes me pay more attention. And uh, I really like that. Yeah. That's, those are all very positive things. Now I have a question for you in, um, and I was just wondering if you could indulge us, some of our listeners. But back in 2016, you had an article in the Drake, am I the, mm-hmm. the North by North article? And um, I I have actually read that and laughed quite a bit because I have a brother as well. But I don't I don't fish with him. But I could definitely pick up on some of the camaraderie that the two of you had. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, you know, um, it was a, a really great trip. So. Um, my brother is my, uh, I have two brothers. Um, they're, they're both, you know, wonderful fishing partners. Um, one of them I fish with a little bit more. And uh, he is just, you know, an Ontario canoe country genius. <laughs> so we started going on these trips when we were like 14 and 15. And uh, I went on a bunch. He went on more. He made it a regular tradition. And uh, the trip that I ended up writing about, we hadn't done one of these trips together in about six or seven years. And there's been some like life changes. He recently gotten married or maybe engaged. To, I'd have to gotta go back to the story on that. <laughs> but anyway, and we'd always gone before we'd always gone with like larger groups four or six people. So this it was our first trip, just me and him. And, uh, so for me and, uh, he doesn't know this maybe, but I was really, really trying hard to pull my way because he was always the trip planner, the delegator, Okay, here's where we're camping. Here's how we're going to kind of do all these different tasks. And so I'm ready to like do my part. I'm ready to pull my weight, you know, to be a, because, you know, if you have six people, one or two people can kind of slough off every now and again. But with two people, you know, on a backcountry canoe trip, when you're really out deep in country, everybody's got to be working hard all the time. Right. And uh, I have this catastrophic ankle injury that's going to <laughs> forever affect my ankle, like, the second day. And so, oh, God. And uh, you know what's worse? Um, he did all the difficult canoe portaging on the way in. And my we, I was going to do all the difficult canoe portaging on the way out. Oh, so that messed up that plan. So he actually ended up, um, hopefully he'll he'll listen to this. And uh, I tried to make him sound like a total badass in the story, which he is. <laughs> but this was like another attempt for me to apologize. Say, man, I, I wish I could have pulled a little bit more weight. But I, I had an ankle that didn't know if it was broken or not. But I remember making 
um, I remember thinking, even if this is, you know, a really like busted ankle, and even if walking on it for a week is going to kind of mess it up forever a little bit, I thought, I mean, when's the next time I'm going to be, you know, in deep northern Ontario with my brother on a solo canoe trip? Right. Maybe right. it'll happen. Maybe it won't. So I remember like looking at the metrics and being <laughs> like, yeah, um, that's a fair price. I'll pay that price. <laughs> Happily, I can still jog. It is months of rehab, uh, but you know it was a real decision that I think this is this is worth it for the experience. So, Jeff, if you're listening, um, still sorry about that. Still trying to make it up to you. Um, one day, hopefully, I will. <laughs> yeah, that that was a great story, and uh, yeah, so I, I encourage everyone to look it up and and uh, and check it out. But that was. It's a great story. Now you're you're a writer. Um, that's that's your profession, correct? That's correct. Yep. Now you, you teach at the University of Michigan. Yeah. So uh, I've been teaching at the University of Michigan since 2007. So I actually went to graduate school there for creative writing, and uh, then I was lucky enough to get a job there teaching creative writing. Um, you know, for creative writers, that's you know nice to have. Uh, <laughs> to have benefits, retirement package, not that easy to come by. So it fit really great, but um, it's kind of similar to your story um, in terms of like changing horses in midstream a little bit. So I'm in, you know, graduate school in my late 20s, and uh, I win a big chunk of money for a novel. Like this fellowship was, you know, designed to be big enough that you don't have to work for a year. You just focus on your writing for a year. Wow. So I went in at the age of 27 and I'm like, cool, you know, going to finish my novel that I started. Uh-huh. And I was having all these conversations with friends, you know, other writer friends. I'm like, ah, I, I can't get any headway in this novel. I'm just fishing all the time. Because imagine 27 year old guy who likes to fish, give him a big <laughs> chunk of change. That's what I was doing, right? I learned Michigan really well that year. You're telling me I don't so, have to work for a year? <laughs> right? <laughs> Foolish. I mean, I would never. <laughs> like you go back in time, I'd say, you be careful, you know, giving that guy that chunk of change. So, but I remember this, it was, I mean, writing my whole life and fishing my whole life. And like, we're talking like since pre-memory, like pretty much for both of those things. And I'm at the bar for like the 20th time saying the same thing. Ah, I didn't get any writing done, I just went fishing. And a friend of mine said, why don't you write about fishing? Hmm. And now it seems like the most obvious, simple thing you could was <laughs> sitting right in front of me. But I went through two decades of my life doing both really intensely. There was never a river in a story. There was never a fish. There were just these two different things. And the beautiful part is, once I started writing about fish and fishing, the writer's block lifted. And that was like seven, eight years ago. And it hasn't... It's, it was... You know, uh, you know, a total godsend to kind of have a friend make this really obvious, you know, uh, statement. But it was kind of life changing. I couldn't put two and two together on my own, unfortunately. Once it was said, I was like, "Huh, that's a pretty good idea." Yeah, that's like kind of a, an epiphany. Like, oh yeah. And sometimes when you're from the when from the inside looking out, you don't see it. But sometimes people from the outside are like. Why haven't you been doing this the whole time? <laughs> right. Because they were just, you know, like they were just really important, but separate parts of myself. And, you know, you practice them in different spaces too. Like, you know, if you're sitting at home writing, you're on the river fishing. So it wasn't like there was, uh, I wish it would have, I wish it would have occurred to me solo, but, uh, but it, but it didn't. Now, do you get inspired while you're on the river? Uh, have you had any stories come out of your time? Like while you were on the river, like, oh man, that'd be a great story. Oh, you know what? Um, yeah, like tons. So I guess it's like a half and half, right? So you're out on the river taking notes um, and thinking about things. And the cool thing for me is about being on the river is that I don't have to try to come up with any ideas. Like, I mean, I turn the mind off, like the, the deliberate mind off, and I just kind of let it wander. And it wanders into some cool places. So, you know, I'm not trying to direct it to anything, but then maybe the thought pops up, maybe you, you write it down, maybe you don't, but I like being on the water because 
it's almost like a like a semi conscious state. Like you lose track of time. Your brain's on. You're moving around, but you're in this kind of uh, you know, I don't know how to describe the state, but there was a Czech psychologist, I believe, Czech Samahai or something, but he described the state called flow, which is where you're super engaged and focused and like just all systems are kind of working perfectly. And it's like, it's like a wonderful state of consciousness. And that's what I get when I'm um, on the water. You can call it a drug, you can call it a, you know, a therapy, but uh, I think if you hook my brain up to like any sort of like actual medical device, you see that that brain is doing good when it's on the water. Yeah, that's that's an awesome that's an awesome statement. There, there's a quote on your on your website that says, um, "Deep wild country is where Dave feels most at home." Why? W- when did you discover that? When did you realize that that's where you feel? Most at home. You know what? Um, so I think I always felt really at home, like in in country. You know, when you're a kid, deep wild country might not be, you know, the same kind of deep wild country you experience as an adult. But even as a kid, you know, living in a grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, it would be four fishing trips a year. You know, we do Memorial Day, Fourth of July, um, Labor Day, and Columbus Day. Those were like my dad's three day weekend. And the, I, the way you even thought about time as a seven or eight year old, there was two kinds of time. There was normal time, and then there was those nine different days a year. No one taught me to do that, and no one like, you know, impressed that upon me. I was just like, well, these are the hallowed sacred days that you look forward to, mm-hmm. and you're thinking about all the time. And it's just like, if you think of like, you know, time flying and like, like, a, it's like two different like water columns uh, or two different currents of time. So I was always really aware as a kid, like, wow, this is, oh, this is the best time. This is the best stuff. This is really good. So that was, you know, even as a young kid. And then at the age of 14, I uh, took a trip to uh, on, uh, the Boundary Waters, um, uh, northern Minnesota with a school group. And that just blew my mind. So I, any hope that I had of like... Uh, living a life that didn't involve fishing that, that ended at the age of 14 because <laughs> we were on this trip and it was just the coolest thing. Uh, my brother and I were both on a swim team at the time and we were used to like, you know, swimming, you know, three, four hours a day, you know, putting it on the work, not going anywhere. All of a sudden we're in these canoes and we've got, you know, a 60 mile loop in front of us. We're working just as hard, but it felt purposeful. It felt good. It was just a totally different experience. We're putting miles behind us. So, um, and you know, we didn't have a safety net. This was, this would have been 1994, you know, pre cell phone. Nobody had a stat phone. Um, you're, you were, uh, you were trusting yourself. You were trusting your, your, your camp mates. And, uh, there was something about the experience that just felt, so superior to other experiences for me. So I've always longed for it. And as a young kid, the saddest day was always Sunday when you went home. So it was hard to enjoy that last morning of fishing off the dock as your parents were packing up the cabin. Because even if you caught a fish, you were, it was still over. So um, I'll, I'll probably spend you know the rest of my life trying to figure out exactly what it is that attracts me to it. But it happened really early and it happened you know, really organically. And uh, it's always felt that like time on the water with friends and family was this different kind of space that was just wonderful. Now you've, you've been on several trips. Uh, You've been all over the world, really. Can you tell us a little bit about Patagonia? Yeah. um, So uh, I've been lucky enough to do both the Chilean side and the Argentinian side. And they are two different Patagonias. In Chile, they call it Green Patagonia. It's, you know, rainforest. It looks a lot like the Pacific Northwest. And then Argentina is kind of like a, a browner Patagonia. So um, some of the, the places like in, in the Rocky Mountains, um, American West. And, uh, I mean, it really, uh, I, I was in Argentina uh, this past spring, and, uh, 
I was on a trip with a good friend of mine who runs a really cool uh, destination travel business called uh, Hemispheres Unlimited. So hemispheresunlimited.com, check it out. Um, Justin Witt. Uh, I actually met him on a previous trip to Patagonia. met him in the airport. He says, come back. We'll go deep into the back country. We'll, we'll try to catch a Wolf for a job. And uh, this story actually uh, is in, going to be in the winter issue of uh, the Drake magazine. So, you know, we, we fly into Estelle, the small town in, in, in uh, Chibut province, Argentina. We drive the truck as literally drove it as far as we could. So it was kind of like, you know, in a song, right? You drive the truck as far as you can, and you leave it, and you walk the rest of the way. So we were fjording rivers, finally got to one that we couldn't cross, and that's when we started walking. So um, we were really off the grid, really in deep, no signs of other people. Um, and we just caught, I mean, the brook trout there, uh, I don't know when they were introduced, but it was uh, it was amazing fishing. We just, I guess, Patagonia is where you go, and it's not like the fishing is like so easy that it's not fun. I mean, it's still really challenging and engaging, but it's, it's the thing that redeems all those other kind of slower days on the water. Um, uh, because we wouldn't probably fish if it were always this one, right? So Patagonia is a place where you're going to have some of these magical days um, on the water where you just catch a ton of really amazing fish. So I caught a bunch of brook trout in the 23, 24-inch range, which is... Jeez. Coming from Wisconsin to Michigan, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, right? But, you know, those were the brook trout that we once had, you know, you know eons ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was this past year, and uh, Chile also wonderful. I mean, you've got these huge blue, you know, brawling rivers. Um, I'm, okay, I'm trying to, like, put into to words what it's like. Uh well, the cool one of the coolest things I ever experienced was in Chilean Patagonia on a place called Yelcho Lake, um, and they have uh, a dragonfly fishery. And I um, might have seen videos, but this is where the fish go airborne all day long for dragonflies. Mm. And so you're just sitting in your boat and watching these dragonflies and low mating maneuvers over the waves. And a 22 inch brown just goes in a huge arc. Eats a bug and crashes down. Wow. And that's happening all up and down the bank, right? Wow. So just an amazing, bizarre thing to see. Snowcap mountains all around and these big rainbows and brown trout going airborne. Not easy to catch though. Um so the trick to that is it's it, there's no anticipation. You wait for them to jump and as soon as they land, you put that fly right where they re enter the water. Because you know that they're there at least for a second. If they, if they miss their bugs they're going after, they're going to stay around and look at it. Um, so you know what's cool about um, you know, the lake fishing there with the sight fishing? So you're seeing them jump and you're casting for them. And then also you're seeing them cruise, you know, the, the weed lines looking for, um, you know, dragonflies as well. So uh, there were times when it really felt like saltwater flats fishing, but I'm doing it for big brown and rainbow trout. So... Yeah, Patagonia is awesome. It's hard to get there. You're going to take a couple of planes, but what's better? I mean, I love when uh, getting to a place takes a long time. Mm-hmm. Anticipation builds. You get to dream, think about it. I could go for faster trips on the way home, but getting there, <laughs> I'm okay if they kind of like, you know, long appetizer course. I can handle that. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of goes back to what you were saying about the last day fishing while your parents are packing up the cabin, it's like the way home. It's like, there's, it's just a lot longer plane ride home than it is down to Patagonia. It, it, it really is. Yeah. You're exhausted. And you know, it's funny about whenever I go on a longer trip, if it's like the, the India or Patagonia or Labrador or somewhere on the way home, I'm still totally like, like I will be like in the airport calling friends, trying to set up, you know, fishing, dates for like the day I get back <laughs> and then I get a haul and I'm like I'm sorry I I I was in a different re- I was in a different reality because um, you get home and you're exhausted and uh, you're pretty good for a while so but it just you do get into that space where um, like when I was in you know Chile the first time I fished, I fished for 12 days in a row and I was shocked 
I, I was, I'd never fished like hard for 12 days in a row. Oh. I was, I could have kept going. Uh-huh. And I was like, Jesus, you know, um, but, uh, yeah, so it kind of put me to a different groove and, uh, you know, maybe 14 would have been enough. Maybe 13, maybe at 13, I would have thought. Um, but the fishing was interesting enough and like you were switching rivers all the time and you're on a lake, you're on a river, you're on different types of places. Uh, and you know, the food was amazing too. So it's a great thing about Patagonia, whether you're in Argentina or in Chile, you're eating lamb kind of left and right and, uh, really fresh. So it'll taste like, tastes like an animal. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was down in, uh, Cor- Cordoba, Argentina back in 2000. Uh, oh, doing like like a music thing and i have not been back since and argentina is oh. the one country that i've been to that i've got to go back to. it's something in it just like gets in your heart i can't explain it any other way it just draws me back and i've been to europe i've been to india i've been to you know a lot of really cool places but there's something about argentina that just I don't know. It just like draws me back. So I spent all last summer or the summer before last learning how to keep cook the Argentine beef and the, uh, the, the perfect oh. chimichurri sauce. So like I took the whole Ooh, summer right. to like figure this thing out because if I can't go there, I'm at least going to try to eat like they do. So, <laughs> you know what, for meat eaters, it's just absolutely, you know, glorious. You will have your fill and it's just, you know, so, so delicious. And, you know, to have all that good wine is going too. Yes. Uh, also <laughs> does not hurt. Yeah. So you, that's, that's, that you gotta get, you gotta make that happen next year. Yeah. Next I gotta winter. get, or this winter. I gotta get down there and, and just check it out and just spend some time and, uh, and do that. Yeah. So what's your most memorable trip? I mean, I know you said that about the boundary waters and that's going to forever hold a special place in your heart, but what would you say is the most memorable place you've been? I guess the place that I'm still processing would be uh, India. Hmm. So this would have been uh, like a 10-day rafting trip down the Mahakali River mm-hmm. um, with my friend Misty Dillon, um, who runs a phenomenal program called the Himalayan Outback. So lots of uh, golden mustard fishing and big and small rivers. He also runs some hiking trips with some tiger safaris as well. But uh, I'd never been to um, Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, that part of the world, and just had no idea what to expect, mm-hmm. and everything was so different. So, from the moment I, you know, got off the plane in Delhi, uh, my eyes were just wide as can be. <laughs> um, just couldn't stop looking at things because everything was so. Great. Like, there's a monkey. There's 20 monkeys. There's you know hundreds <laughs> of monkeys. There's all these animals and all these people and uh, this traffic that's just bizarre and chaotic and then you know uh just these rivers that are originating and you know the glaciers in tibet and and in china and you know it's a hundred degree day these rivers are still like going pretty cold they're just a couple days removed from the glacier so um that was pretty pretty wild so i mean I mean, and it was, uh, what's cool about it, I mean, I've done, you know, overnight rafting trips, but this was, you know, uh, a six night rafting trip where, uh, you know, we weren't getting resupplied at any point along the way. We were a remote, um, country. Huh. So how do you keep meat fresh in, in, in heat like that when you don't have like a store you can buy ice? You don't kill the chickens until it's time for them to get eaten. So wow. we'd have a cardboard box of live chicken. But I remember like <laughs> being in the classroom rapid, wearing a helmet and a life jacket, and look at the chef's raft. He had his own raft, he had a raft, and there's one chicken managing to cut out. And I wonder what that chicken think. You know, it is. <laughs> you know, I never. We, they, they kind of you know processed them off in the bushes. We didn't see it, but these chickens had the ride of their life. Uh, <laughs> Down this river. Down the down the river, it has a whole nother, or up the river, or whatever, yeah. has a whole nother meaning now. So. Yeah. And, you know, all along the banks, you have people, you know, like, living really traditionally. Um, mm. You know, and, like, the, you know, thousand-year-old steps um, and people on pilgrimages just kind of walking from temple to temple. And, uh, you know, I got my forehead blessed by... Uh, 
you know, um, priest called Baba, you know, at this one temple over the confluence. Crazy thing about their temples is they're always at the uh, river confluences, which are, which are sacred spaces, but those are also great fishing spots. Mm. But they don't like, you know, you know, fishing at the sacred spot because, you know, it's, uh, who are these guys just, you know, casting a, a fly rod? So <laughs> it, sometimes we couldn't fish the confluences, only fished around them, but uh, I, I didn't mind because you still got to be, you know, fishing within view of this, thousand or two thousand year old temple hmm. in cold glacial water. So um yeah that was I mean so memorable. Uh there's just again there's so much I I'm still thinking about it, still processing it. There were just so many crazy things to see. Um so that would be a pretty memorable but, you know all fishing trips are are actually pretty memorable. So I uh, just got back from a week long trip in the UP. Um uh it's an annual trip that me and my friends take. We you know, go deep on a river that I cannot name, camp along the banks, we <laughs> fish musky hard for a couple of days. Um, so the cool thing about fishing is you don't have to go far to have a memorable magical experience. Mm-hmm. So um, awesome. it's cool you know the stars align that you're allowed to do that, but I don't think I'd be missing out if I never had another international trip. Um or even like left the Midwest. I mean I love the the Midwest, and I think part of like the practice of like kind of the philosophical or metaphysical practice of being an angler is to like to inhabit the water that you're you're on that you have, and hmm. um, yeah, magazines they they kind of exist by selling these exotic stories. That's totally cool, but um, I don't think it should ever be a, a sport that depends on these exotic stories. Um, like the close to home stories are just as cool. Um, though it doesn't it might not seem that way. I'm sure they're, they're not as sexy, but it's where we grow up. It really is where we have so many memories with friends and family. And you're, you're exactly right. You're, yeah. yeah. You know what? Like you can really, like if you challenge yourself to like just kind of fish really new water, um, and challenging water, right? you can have just really wonderful experiences and really exotic and, you know, kind of, you can have adventures. Um, so, uh, I really encourage everybody to do some bushwhacking. And, uh, I remember I was once in the driftless part of Wisconsin. I was talking to a legendary Wisconsin angler named Ron Mann. He used to run a, uh, a bunch of, uh, um, cabins on the, the, the Brule, upper Brule River in Northwestern Wisconsin. In any case, you know, he's fished all over Wisconsin and we're just, you know, we started out talking about the places that we had fished and then we started talking about the places that we wanted to fish. And he had a couple decades on me. And by a couple decades, I mean, you know, he had a good, you know, four or five on me and he was in great shape, you know, for um, being an older gentleman. But there were some rivers that he'd been wanting to fish for, 30 years and just hadn't gotten around to it. And some of the, them were the same rivers that I wanted to fish. And so it really impressed upon me, like, wow, it's, it's kind of easy to neglect, like, oh, that's a river in my home state that I'm going to fish one day. Mm-hmm. Um, don't wait too long. Go fish that river. Right. Um, it's probably going to be pretty cool. Um, and because cause you, you can really, like, you yeah, you you can kind of miss out on some of the, the things that are that are kind of right under your nose. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> yeah, especially in Michigan, we have so much water here. It's you know, there's so many different species. It, it, it's it would literally take you a lifetime to uh, to get probably twenty percent of it. <laughs> yeah, I agree, and you know, you're in the great you're in the western part of the state. So um, sometimes I all I often say to friends, man, I wish. You know, the University of Michigan, <laughs> maybe it was in Traverse City or somewhere in the western part of the state, mm-hmm. um, because uh, yeah, you're, you're so close, so close to so much great water. So, where about do you fish? I fish in, uh, in um, Michigan? well in the in the summertime. I fish up in uh, on the Flat River for smallmouth, and yep. then um, I fish up in on the Muskegon River. Um, oh, that's, great. That's a great river. And then um, P, the PM, the Pier Marquette, obviously, occasionally, not too much because um, it's a little crowded. 
in um and then i have some a couple of rivers north of there like the upper manistee like above the dam um fishing for brown trout stuff like that so i've got some but you know like the rogue river is a great steelhead river and it's literally probably 20 minutes from my office you know and you know where where an exciting fishery that is so um i've got a uh, november december trout magazine you know the magazine published by um uh trout unlimited um, I did a story about a couple of different conservation projects in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. One of them was on the road, and uh, mm. I was blown away by some of the amazing work being done yeah. to make sure that, like, to make sure that rivers have the ability to kind of, like, be rivers. Dave, if someone wanted to get a hold of you or find your book or buy your book, what would they need to do to do that? Sure. Well, always great to go to your local fly shop. And it's not just about, I mean, sure, part of it is supporting, um, you know, uh, a mom and pop uh, brick and mortar entity. That in and of itself is great and good. But for beginning fly anglers, for new fly anglers, what they might not know is fly shops, is, they're really, they're not just places where you buy things. Mm-hmm. Where all the innovation happens, as well, where all the, the information flows through. So, a fly shop is not just—I mean, it's more of a—it's it's more of a sacred location than just a place to buy things. Absolutely. And a big box store tends to be more of a place to buy things. Mm-hmm. But when when new fly patterns and new discoveries are being made, um, that they're being made by people who spend time in and work in fly shops. Mm-hmm. And the people who are at fly shops are, I mean, they have um, a, a body of knowledge about those local watersheds that you're fishing on that, you know, takes decades to accrue. And they're just really incredible resources. Of course, you can't just go up and say, hey, I want to download your brain. Give mm-hmm. me some spots. That's not going to happen. <laughs> So um, I think, you know, going to your local fly shop to try to pick up the books there and, like, visiting that fly shop regularly, not to buy a fly rod every time, mm-hmm. maybe to buy some hooks, maybe to buy a couple flies, maybe to buy some tippets. But when you kind of make it a regular practice, and, you know, there are a lot of fly shops in the country, and not saying, like, drive three hours you know, every, every week to a fly shop, but if you've got something local, um, they're cool places to hang out and uh, great places to learn things. Head down to your local fly shop. If it's not there, it's on Amazon. So, all right. Yeah. And, uh, and the what, last plug I'll last plug I'll do. So, um, of the two books, um, you know, the smallmouth book. Uh, real quick plug. The thing that makes a smallmouth book unique is that we went away from a trout centric approach that's really thinking about hatch matching and feeding the fish what it's keyed in on. Um, so we're really in that book. Um, teaching anglers to make fly and presentation decisions based on the water that they're fishing, not what the fish are eating. Mm. So um, there are occasions where, yes, that mama bass is eating crayfish. You cannot convincingly present the crayfish imitation to a fish in that tiny, skinny water. Um, much easier to make this other sort of presentation. So I think it's a cool book for every angler because it's less a foodstuff-oriented you know, text and it's more thinking about the actual water and where the fish is in the water. Drop rate, depth rate, you know, whether we're making parallel or perpendicular presentations. So, cool book for everyone, especially smallmouth anglers. And uh, the other book, if you're a gear angler, kind of uh, spinning a big cast angler, you can call them gear anglers in the fly world, looking for a way in, um, it's a multi-species book. So, one thing that I wanted to communicate to readers was, it is not all about trout. Um, one of the reasons that I never took up fly fishing as a kid was like, well, oh, got no trout streams around me. Right, not going right. to fly fish. Right. So total misnomer. Like there's, there's so many different ways into the sport now. You can enter into it at musky, carp, panfish, mm-hmm. bass. You can only fish for that one species. You can fish for a whole ton of species. So what I try to communicate in that book is, hey, you like fishing for gar? I mean, I don't have a gar chapter, but the the spirit of the book is. Um, if there's a fish, it will eat a fly because a fly can imitate anything, a bait fish, a crayfish, and that flies through the air. Mm-hmm. One of the most common questions I get from 
some non-fly angler and says, must be able to fly? <laughs> and then you show them a fly the size of your forearm or longer and show them how it swims in the water. And they're like, okay, that's just like, you know, a serpentine collection of, you know, hair and feathers. And <laughs> yeah, that looks like a fish. So, um, so yeah, um, if, if you're already a fly angler, maybe you've got like a gear fishing friend who's kind of a little bit curious about what you're doing. Um, the book's cool um, for that too. It's got like 210 photos from all over the world. So um, even if you just look at the pictures, pretty fun to page through. Well, that's great. Well, we'll put links up to your website um, up. We'll, we tell people to go to their local fly shop. And uh, also we can put the, the Amazon links up there as well if, if people would like to, to check that out also. And we, we really appreciate you spending some time with us today or tonight, Dave. Jeff, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, I love this show. So really happy that I can contribute to it. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dave. And thank you for listening to the Remote No Pressure podcast. Don't forget, we have our Fly Tying Radio on Spotify. Just look up Remote No Pressure Fly Tying Radio. Check out the curated playlist. Also, check out our website, remotenopressure.com. Be sure to sign up for our mailing list. Hey, you guys, have a great week. And until next time, go fishing.